Hello and welcome to this Tough Talk presented from the Women Deliver Conference in Copenhagen. I'm Ridi Klabi. For some girls, the rite of passage into adulthood is marred by the grueling experience of female genital mutilation, also known as FGM. In the studio, I have with me Alimatu Dimonikene. Alimatu was just 16 years old when she underwent FGM in Sierra Leone, organized by her own grandmother. Today, she's an activist fighting to end the practice of FGM, working with a number of organizations, including the United Nations. Welcome, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Why were you cut? Um, for my grandmother, because I'd done my GCSEs exams in Sierra Leone and she knew I was going to go to the UK because my dad had always said, as, as soon as my exams were over, I was gonna go to the UK to study. And so she felt I was leaving already because I was raised sort of in a Western way. And she felt I'd lost a lot of my culture and my beliefs. And FGM obviously is a big cultural, traditional practice in Sierra Leone. And she felt if I leave, even though I was 16 at that time, um, I would lose everything, but I did not. And so she made this arrangement with someone I had no idea who they were for myself and my sisters to be cut. And um, she never knew the damage that was to come. Um, but I had a lot of bad experience because of my FGM. It was only when I got to the UK that I realized um, how impact it, it had been for me. And how did it affect you? It affected me in many ways, um, physically, emotionally, psychologically. I just couldn't understand why why me? Why should this happen to me? Um, I was told the reasons why FGM was done was that um, for you to be clean. And this is by your grandmother? By my grandmother. Um, for me not to have sex before marriage. I didn't have sex before marriage. I, I was very academically inclined. I loved school. I was doing really well. I didn't have any boyfriends. So I wasn't promiscuous as they say. Um, so things was going well for me. There was no reason to, according to her, um, why I should have to go undergo FGM. Did you know anybody who underwent FGM? I mean, was this a, a, a prolific practice in the community or you were one of the very unlucky ones? Um, unfortunately, in my country where I'm from, FGM is highly, it's a high prevalence. Um, almost be girls between age 15 to 49 years old have undergone FGM. We have about 85% of Sierra Leonean women. So my mother, my grandmother, her mother before her, my sisters, my children, my daughters are the only girls in my generation who haven't undergone FGM. So it's, 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 a, it's a high prevalent um, practice in the country and it's steeped in, in mysticism, it's steeped in violence, mm -hmm. and which is never told and never spoken about because it's, it's taboo to even mention the word um, in my country, we don't call it FGM, it's called bondo. And even saying that word, people will look at you, well, why? It's ironic, there's an irony to this, isn't it? Because the practice is so widespread and yet you're not supposed to be talking about it publicly. Uh, you're, you're forbidden to speak about it. And in speaking about it, it's seen as you bring in a curse upon yourself. Because again, as much as it's a practice that predates religion, um, but for some people, that's a practice that actually brings women together. So in some communities, women will look at you and like, you want to take something we hold so dearly, even though they, a lot of them are also victims themselves, but it's something that brings them together. How do you feel though about culture? Because culture is meant to be something beautiful that gives us identity. And yet in the name of culture, there are violations that happen. How do you reconcile those well, two worlds? Well, this is what, bothers me because for me, I love everything there is to love about Africa. I love my culture, my tradition. In itself, it's what brings us together as people, as a spoken language, but there is harming a lot in our traditions and in our practice. So for me as a campaigner, it's saying you can do whatever else you need to do, but do not harm the girls and don't encourage FGM or child and early marriage because these have lasting impact and compli um, complications that arise when children and young girls in that matter who undergo the practice of FGM in some times, there are no medications, no anesthetic given, 
the instruments that I use could leave a woman scarred for life and psychologically a lot of women suffer mental anguish and their well-being is affected and people struggle, a lot of women including myself. How did you overcome that? I mean the trauma and the psychological damage, how did you rise above that? Well I found myself in the UK at 22, I got married and I was pregnant and fortunately that woman is here at this conference today and she'll be talking about maternal health and the impact that some tradition and practices have on women. But she was the first woman to look at me and said, because you've undergone this practice, you are going to have difficulties delivering a baby, but I would help you. And she held my hand and was very sincere and very kind and just made me feel, because I, before that I, I never felt as a woman, I felt like an object. I felt worse than an object sometimes. And I struggled with my relationship. I didn't love my family. I didn't love my children. I couldn't understand why was I in the world because everything else I held and I believed in as a woman, my sexuality was who I was. My identity of being African was robbed from me. And so I couldn't identify, I couldn't belong in any group. So it was a struggle. But she knew what I needed and she said you've got to get help and the first help was getting psychological help. Um, it took me 22 years to speak about my FGM experience. As much as I was going through a lot of difficulties, I couldn't explain it to anybody it's with any form of violence like rape, like sexual abuse. It's a challenge for women to speak so what we do as campaigners is allowing women safe spaces to talk about these issues because that's what was done to me. Somebody held my hand and, I, and said to me as much as this is a horrible experience obviously it's never going to go away but we can make it better, we can make things work. What about education? I mean is that, can that be one of the most effective tools to educate not just the girls themselves because you couldn't have protected yourself at that time but their parents and grandparents? I, I, I strongly believe in education, it's pivotal and for me I was educated as much as I knew what had happened and I, f I went out searching but I still was in denial myself and that's what a lot of our communities and our families, women in our communities do not understand because we do not talk about these things. So sometimes the moment you start to open up is when you begin to connect the dots. Like for myself, I was self-harming and couldn't understand why was I self-harming. I was making myself vulnerable in the sense I was putting myself in risky relationships and difficulties, but I couldn't understand. That was because I did not like myself because as a young girl, somebody has violated me. So in many sense, in many cultures, in many societies, in, a, in places where FGM is practiced, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, you see other forms of violence coming out of FGM. So we see high prevalence of domestic abuse. We see high prevalence of sexual abuse. We now are beginning to see other forms of violence like sexual exploitation on children because if young girls as young as maybe two, three years old have had their first sexual violence, which is FGM for some girls, and then they don't realize that and they become sort of a a prey for vulnerable for, for men who or women as well who see them as, as young people without any fear now and so will take advantage of that. So there, there's a link between the abuse and the trauma and the violation that happens in childhood and how a, a woman in particular uh, uh, develops later on in life and is vulnerable, even made vulnerable to more uh, sexual violence. But let's just talk about global awareness. How do we tackle, tackle this at a global level, what do we need to do to tackle this? Um, on a global level, I think governments with a political will, we see in the UK where I live, um, from July 2014, the UK government held a world summit to raise the issue and connect it with another form of violence, which was hidden, which was child and early marriage. So having a political will and allowing communities themselves to take the lead. In the UK, we have a global campaign called the Girl Generation. And the theme of that um, campaign is an African-led because in Africa, unfortunately, we have more than 30 countries that practice FGM. So it's the continent with the highest number of countries with high prevalence. But other countries in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Yemen, 
in, in Saudi Arabia, there are other forms of communities that are practicing some form of FGM. We're now seen in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we know it's a capital of rape. There's some form of a, a violation on women's genital. So it's bringing countries, communities, so similar to what is happening here in the Women Deliver Conference, organizations, practitioners, every stakeholder, we all have a part to play. That's very encouraging and a huge challenge, really. But I just want to know, how do you feel about your grandmother now? How do you feel about family relationships? Because you experienced this and it started from the home. Yeah. Well, she herself is a victim and this is why we need to end FGM because at age 12 or 13, I'm not even sure what her real age was, she was forced into a marriage. And for her, everything she lived for is bearing children. She gave birth to 12 children. I think my father was born when she was about 14 or 15. So in some communities doing FGM is making a child being wanted and marriageable and having the best in life but obviously they don't understand that it doesn't work that way. For me, she thought I would meet a man who will give me five cows in a big yard. Unfortunately, he doesn't have five cows in London. What he have is a small mini car and there's not much to it. And so we can make our girls inspire and be empowered with other things. Education is one and, and, and sort of investing in girls' future, making sure girls have a safe space to grow and talking with young women, what do we value most in our bodies, in our self-esteem, in confidence? And I think with the sort of work that's globally now, we can do that. Organisations like Plan UK, Equality Now, Girls Not Bride are all looking at these issues. Even the United Nations in many countries in Africa, I was in Senegal several weeks ago, and the African continent itself has recently just banned FGM. So I think in my lifetime, probably not, but I'm hoping that in my children's lifetime, my girls in particular, we will end FGM. But investing in women and having men as well be part of this discussion. So far, we've not included men and young men for that matter. We have to include the young boys because in many communities where FGM is practiced, it is said it's done for the men, but the men said it's not done for us. So we need to bring them into this, the conversation. Ali Mathieu de Monikeni, thank you so much for talking to us today and for alerting us and educating us. And of course, it highlights the importance of education because when we know better, we do better. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching this edition of Tough Talk at the Women Deliver Conference in Copenhagen. Don't forget to tune in to our other programs. And you can also follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Women Deliver. And don't forget to use the hashtag WD Live. Bye-bye.